Hello, this is Michael Roach, and this is another episode of A Conversation with the Blues, this time with our guest, John Anderson. And I'd like to start by saying that the podcast is sponsored by the European Blues Association, incorporating the archive of African American music. And I'd like to let everyone know that the collection, the Paul Oliver Collection, is housed over at Oxford Brooks University, over at Cowley Road in Oxford, and the cataloging digitizing is complete and the access is publicly available to everyone who want to look through the Paul Oliver collection <coughs> for research resource material so that you can study this blues African American context. John you collected an amazing absolutely amazing sheet music collection rare sheet music and donated it to the EBA. It's now housed over there in Brooks. And it's what we're here to talk about, John's collection. And i just like to say, John, thank you for, you know, taking the time to come to share your passion with uh, the blues and the sheet music that you collected with us, in addition to donating it to us as well. But how did you get started? I mean, tell us about your background in terms of where did this come from? I mean, your interest in rare sheet music? Uh, well, um, it's hard to know, really. There are two things, really. First of all, um, my father was um, into publicity for big bands before the war in Scotland, so he was very into swing, and he was also very into Django Reinhardt. So the first three records I bought with my little suitcase record player were Little Red Rooster by The Stones, Chess Greatest Hits, and Jangology uh, when I was 15. So my father was an influence, and I collected in junk shops over the years a lot of Art Deco 20s, 30s sheet music, just because they're attractive objects and quite interesting in their own right. Um, another source of interest from my grandmother, who used to go to the music hall before the First World War, so she used to sing me all these um, music hall songs, a lot of which were minstrel songs. Um, and the real catalyst for the African American collection was Paul Oliver. Um, we were over at his house for an EBA committee meeting and I looked at, he had a picture of sheet minstrel, uh, a minstrel sheet on the wall. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And he said, yes, I've got very few sheet music. So I started thinking, oh, and just at that point, uh, eBay got going. And I'll say a bit more about eBay in a minute. So I really built them up because it's something the collection didn't have. And... I think they're incredibly important for telling the real story of the development of popular music, particularly African-American music, and also uh, dispelling a few myths. Um, it says, I hate to stop you there, but mm -hmm. for people that may not know this, we were once cataloging Paul's collection at his house. Mm -hmm. And I used to go over once a week and I used to pick up a box of books and I would... <coughs> You know, take them home, and I get a second box, and I would take a box over to John's house, and John would catalog his box. I would catalog mine. We would go subject, title, author, ISBN number, etc. And then, as we were going from the downstairs to the upstairs uh, section of his house, along the stairwell, there was all this rare framed sheet music, Civil War sheet music, and etc. on his wall. And every time you go up the steps in Paul's house, you would always stop and read the titles, look at the images, and etc. And so. That's what you were referring to. Yes, and, and uh, Paul said, oh, I haven't, haven't really got very many. Because obviously, they, before eBay, they would be incredibly hard to get hold of. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, once eBay started, the floodgates opened. And interestingly enough, they more they disappeared several years ago off eBay. So they're all back into collections now, I suspect. Yeah. So that was my real... Um, interest i've also studied and interested in social history because i think the sheet music tell you a lot more about the social context of what was going on that produced the music and that's what we're about social context because um often music books 
are written from the point of view of just the music and not the point of view of the context. Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it because it needs to be reversed. Yes, because, because the music reflects its time and exactly. developments um, and the social changes and so on that are going on. Yes, you had mass migration. Yes. So a lot of just happened when people migrated from these rural areas to these urban centers and they had to create from nowhere, out of nothing, this kind of uh, infrastructure so that they could have facilities, so that they could have a rent party, mm -hmm. so that they can have a, a dance, so they can have a nightclub, so that they can have access to resources, so that they can have entertainment. So that was before there was, what would you say, uh, uh, commercial enterprises. So these were people that were, you know, entrepreneurs. They were just making things up as they were going along and trying to make a living, earn a living out of it. I think I think one of the things that's come up most because I wanted what I wanted to get across today was the importance of the collection for actually looking at context um, and why is this sheet music like this? Why has it got this artist on it? Why are these songwriters um, particularly important? Um, so I wanted to say just a bit about the collection itself. Okay. Um, so. It's interesting, the collection ranges, it's purely uh, focused on African American music. Uh, and it start, uh, the earliest sheet is 1832. 1832? And um, it goes up to the 70s as a few, but the main period is really 1890 to 1930, which is because sheet music sort of fell off after about 1930 there was less and less of it radio well that's what killed records i'll come to that later okay <laughs> um so the actual sheet music there's um 857 african-american sheets there's some european published sheets with african-american songs or themes um there's gospel old time country instructors how to play ragtime things like that um, and how to use your catalog guitar and um, part scores for early pre-jazz with that stuff from New Orleans uh, so there's about 950 pieces in that collection um, how does it compare well the Library of Congress only has 1500 pieces digitized okay um, uh, the University of South Florida has 4,000, 4, but that's everything. Yeah. Um, and so does New York Public Library and Brown. And there's a very big African-American one I found, but it's not digitized, um, which is in the Smithsonian. But it's a huge collection. It's like yeah. 7,000 sheets, African-American sheets or something, um, which I wouldn't be sure how many there are. But I mean, it's interesting, we'll come on to the publishing later. Um, and the other bit that I think is really important that goes with it that I was collecting as well were postcards, which are from 1894 to 1920s. Um, so there's about um, 600 of those. Okay, 600 Because postcards. they're actual, often actual photos of places or African-American life or derogatory cards. I suppose we ought to say something about the language and the images that you might yes, hear and see in this, in the music or in the um, sheet music cover. It's extremely inflammatory, derogatory, and is reflective of the political context of its time. Yeah, and so we are keeping it in that context when we make references to it, because we were not and should not endorse any of it for no. that matter, because we want to make sure that we steer clear of any kind of uh, contempt that someone may have for what we may be showcasing and showing people. And uh, we want we don't want to get in trouble with our platform as well. So well, it's dangerous because it's still relevant. It's still being seen on social media. It's in um, events happening across Western Europe and the States, it, it's, um, it is inflammatory, and, um, but it is actually the politics drive the language.
Yeah, and I, and I hope that we have a discussion well, about yeah, that as well. So I'll, I'll come to that. And the sheet music makes that very clear, and so do the postcards, actually. Yeah. Um, and I've also got some illustrated magazine articles, um, which have really interesting line drawings that are not derogatory, because they were in magazines. <coughs> um, um, things about the drumming in Congo Square, things about corn shucking, things that, that they're interesting articles, things about hoboing in the 1890s. So they actually have some really nice line illustrations in their small articles, and even one complaining about the old days minstrelsy and how it was better, and that was written in the 1870s. But anyway. Things were always better when you were younger. <laughs> How about that? So it's um, quite a large collection. And for example, there were 532 published blues before Crazy Blues. Now, Crazy Blues is what a lot of people say started the whole thing with Perry Bradford. We'll come to that okay. when we look at recording. Because... Um, uh, so, of the 532, the collection has 20% of them. So, but let me just start. Here's an original of Crazy Blues. And I also will uh, superimpose that uh, on the screen. Uh, 1920, with Mamie Smith, by Perry Bradford, African American, Perry Bradford. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Yes, yeah, so we'll come back to Perry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was just pointing out that the um, the, the, the collection has 20% of all published titles with blues in them. The blues, 20%, okay. Um, so it's, um, it's a significant collection. And now it's digitized. You can add it to all the others. If you're really studying things, it will become really valuable, I think. Uh, one of the other things I think the collection helps to do is to dispel myths. Okay. <laughs> and um, this book, Romancing the Folk, Public Memory and American Roots Music, is really interesting. It's about the collectors. So John and Alan Lomax, but an earlier ones, so obviously okay. the Cecil Sharp with his ballads and looking for folk music and right back into the 19th century you've got um, people in Europe look, looking for folk music because that's all about establishing a nationalist myth so um, and also John Lomax was doing that but Alan Lomax was also working on behalf sort of the American Communist Party establishing a workers myth so this is interesting at looking the myths that surround the history of popular music, particularly African American music. And um, I think it, when you look at the collection, it actually you think, no, it's not like this at all. It wasn't six men in a field. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, was yeah. three men in suits writing this in New York. Exactly. <laughs> uh, which is parallel to English folk music. Uh, so um, I think the collection actually starts to dispel some of the myths, of particularly grown up since the 60s, I think, in, in around the music and around um, who is important. So, oh, well, I, I like that. I really like that because if you really think about it, when the Mamie Smith recordings took place in 1920, they, they, you know, they chose stars that was big on the on the vaudeville circuit yes that was already established artists from 10 years ago yes and, and, we, and that's we from can, like 1910 I, I wanted to talk about recording because yes. i think the collection actually reinforces what's come out of the woodwork on recording in the last 20 years which wasn't there when i started collecting it it's a lot of information, yes. Yeah. There's an awful lot of information now on YouTube, the internet, internet archive, um, film archives, that wasn't available earlier, and there's no excuse, really, for perpetuating a lot of the myths. Anyway, and, so... we we got to also remember Lynn Abbott and Derek Sur Surf, oh, yes. Ragged But Right. This is an amazing book with yes. full of information. And then they have another one here, uh, Uh, the original blues, uh, the emergence of the blues, 1899 to 1926. This is Abbott and Surf because 
Ragged and Wright covers an earlier period. And so it's it's no excuse for people to continue no. saying a lot of the things that they're saying, knowing that this amazing research has already been done mm -hmm. and shed light on a number of... Well, it's another book I like to bring out as well. I mean, it's Keep Cool, the black activist who built the Jazz Age by Ted Vincent. And so he covers the same kind of argument about how people were left out and these omissions are what we're going to discuss. So, mm. I just was, while we're doing this bit, I was going to show you some of the collections so that people at home can see it. So this is the earlier sheet, which is Claire de Kitchen, Old okay. Virginia Never Tie by Mr. Rice, who of course is the first Jim Crow um, dancer. Okay, now. But you notice from the tune that it's a jig. It's a jig, okay. Um, and I was going to say this later, but the the evidence is that the main audience for the early, very early minstrelsy was very young Irish in men in Boston and New York. Okay. So it was like punk. <laughs> <laughs> it was disaffected young men recently immigrated or into the states in the cities okay. it's city music this was city yes and it's um uh, so another one that the collection has is um, a bit later when minstrelsy was um, tidied up and the middle classes became going and they used to have meals and all sorts in the theatre. Uh, so this is the Ethiopian Serenaders who were a very famous group. This is 1842, this sheet. Well, but you can this? see the instruments. You've got the bones, accordion, tambourine and two of the early fretless banjos. So authentic in instruments. One, It's interesting, there's another um, there's a lot of talk about appropriation and authenticity um, the search for authenticity uh, and it, it, it's like as soon as we start appropriating music we're looking for authentic music Yeah, yeah. reminds you of blues doesn't it <laughs> right. um, and it goes on to things like um, this is 1902 I Got Mine by um, John Queen who was important for writing a lot of African American type songs um, and it uh, survived to be recorded by many people Pink Anderson for one in the guitar player and the 60s yeah, guitar player um, um, well lots of people did and I got mine yeah I got, blind, mine, blind. I got mine. Yes. yes, and so this is the first recording I could find from 1902. 1902. I got mine. Sung by Columns and Nita. Why, where did you get it? Well, I really wouldn't care to say. <laughs> I went out. To a nigger crap game, it was against my will. The fool took all my money except one greenback dollar bill. There was a hundred dollar bet upon the table. The nigger point was nine. Just then the copper stepped through the door, but I got mine. I got mine, boys. I got mine. I grabbed that hundred dollar bill to the window. I did fine. Ever since then, I've worn good clothes, living on chicken and wine. I'm the leader of society, and I got mine. I got mine, boys. I got mine. I grabbed that hundred dollar bill to the window. I did fine. 
Ever since then I've worn good clothes and I'm sick and have mine. I'm the leader of society since I got mine. I got a good horse, yes, I got the market super. I'll it out for the visit my gal the hour. It was about nine. Dressed up like one millionaire and I'm feeling right in line. I caught her sitting on another nigga's lap. Now that is a very good sign. I told her what I thought of him then. I got mine. I got mine, boy. I got mine. That nigga pulled his shotgun out and used it by the fire. I tried to get through the window, but I couldn't get through in time. I eat my meal for a man to pieces. I got mine. I got mine, boys. I got mine. That nigga pulled his shotgun out and used it by the fire. I tried to get through the window, but I couldn't get through in time. I eat my meals for a man who keeps it. I got mine. Um, it's it's the tune we know, but it, oh, they all start these early recordings, obviously in the very beginning, with an introduction and then a lot of patter, because they're sort of linked to the minstrel show, so you have patter, yeah. you have the end men doing patter. So, um, and then it goes, uh, for example, this is a very interesting sheet from 1926. Uh, Shake That Thing by Papa Charlie Jackson, who was a African-American, played big banjo, mm -hmm. so he must have been in vaudeville for quite a long time beforehand, mm -hmm. and um, it's the only sheet music I've seen from someone who is in that sort of genre, Yeah, that's, that's seen as a 20s blues player, because he did quite a lot of blues. Um, you can see it has derogatory stereotypes, um, but it's also sort of 20s and we're getting spats and tap dancing in here. And um, it's a white orchestra, Guy Lombardo. Who Guy was, Lombardo and his orchestra. Who was famous, famous for um, a sort of sweet sound later on. But uh, so the, the 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 collection spans all sorts of things, which you'll see as we go through. I'll put some examples up and play some original sounds. Oh, I find it really amazing because when I think of the sheet music, I used to frown on it. To be quite honest with you, I'm like, ooh, just disgusting. Yeah. You know the kind of imagery that you see, especially as a black mm. person. You know, I, I didn't want to see that. And then when I started looking at the artistic kind of way in which it was presented, it seemed like every last one of them have these stereotypical kind of, you know, features that I don't know people that look like that. What are you mm -hmm. doing? You know, what's, what's going on here? And so, but it sold. And that's what sold it, to be quite honest with you, because that was the characteristic that the marketers felt it needed. And I wonder how many units did that sell? Um, that's not really known, but I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit later. But there's quite a few that has been sold in very large numbers. One of the with things, those features. One of the, oh, of that, with the individual sheets, one of the things about eBay is you can get a vague idea, well, I, which I didn't record, unfortunately, of how common, how much it's sold okay. by the number that you see. It's a little yeah. bit like when I first got Bessie Smith 78s, there were lots of them. So obviously they sold a lot yeah. for them to be available and fairly low price. And I think that's the true with the sheet music, if it's fairly common then you, they must have yes. sold a lot of units and that happened to survive. There's a surviving unit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
So you get a rough idea. So in that case, the most popular blues was the alcoholic blues written in 1919 against prohibition because that was it just came up all the time every week. Um, whereas some of the others were very rare. For example, St. Louis Blues, I only ever saw one copy. Okay. And you think, hmm. Whereas Memphis Blues, I saw lots of copies. Because it was extremely popular. Yes, yeah. that, and that was two years before. But it, it's just very interesting to get some rough idea that to A, to have survived, <laughs> B, to be many of them, then you would expect that there must have been quite a lot sold. Yeah, that's true, because I was just looking at how one of the copies of, for my collection that carried me back to old Virginia, how I was just lucky to find it, you know, and it's, it's torn, but this is how mostly when you find them, they survived in this condition. But it was a plantation song by James Bland, who was an African-American. And he was quite big, James Bland. And... I recently looked online and I found that there was a uh, on YouTube Ray Charles Ray Charles actually playing and singing this song on YouTube and I found it amazing he actually sang it Virginia Virginia as opposed to Virginia mm -hmm. and uh, in the old uh, kind of dialect and which is mainly attributed to Paul Lawrence Dunbar who was the uh, prolific well-known African-American writer who uh, used a lot of the dialect, wrote in the way in which, you know, black people actually spoke. And then later on, around the early 1900s, he hated the fact that everybody started using D as opposed to T-H-E, the, you know, when it was, you know, writing about the way in which black people speak. And so, yeah, I find this really fascinating. I mean, uh, the whole it's story. A British copy. Um, an awful lot of these were copyright was very hazy to start with. <laughs> yeah. So all the early sheets in America were published in New York and Boston. Um, and there were also quite a few published in London all through the 19th century until the big firms got their act together with copyright. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you say that because um, this is a, a Florence Mills one that I've I found again since mm. living here as well. Mm. Florence Mills, uh, I'm a little blackbird looking for a bluebird. And this was uh, presented by Charles Cochran at the London Pavilion. So I found that really interesting as well. One of the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, 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 well, with the date, I'm trying to find it. 1925. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I wanted to talk about was this constant traveling of professional artists. Um, there's recordings of Dickens seeing um, African Americans do dancing in New York in the 1840s there's um, African American um, artists coming to London in the 1840s and then all the way through and we know Queen Victoria liked, was very fond of the Fisk Jubilee troupe and uh, she made George V and another one <laughs> learn the banjo and they had a black tutor I think um, and in fact George V had a huge collection of banjos and ukuleles they named a banjo after him I looked today um, so they were playing this sort of music which again brings you back to the same issue of this cross-cultural is it appropriation or is it just imitation or is it yeah, it's it, it, very interesting because I wanted to just stop you again as well, John, just because to, to, this is from the book From Cake Walks to Concert <coughs> Halls, an illustrated uh, history of African American popular music from 1895 to 1930 by Thomas L. Morgan and William Barlow. But they talked here about uh, 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 James Bland, and I just wanted to just say this. I found this really interesting. James Bland wrote more than 700 songs, and most of which they were sentimental ballads and jubilee style spirituals and early in his menstrual career he performed what you call refined comedy routine in blackface and his biggest well-known composition was carrying me back to old virginia about a free slave longing for his former master and the good old plantation life during slavery became the state anthem of virginia 
And then after enjoying a period of menstrual sodom in the <coughs> 1870s, Bland spent most of the next decade touring in Europe, just what you was talking mm -hmm. about, touring in Europe. And he matured both as a performer and as a composer. Unfortunately, when he returned to the United States in the 1890s, his days as a minstrel star were long forgotten. In spite of his European triumphs, Bland was unable to make a comeback on North American soil. There was no work for a cultured and serious black minstrel. He dropped out of the public eye and years later died impoverished, living in obscurity in Philadelphia. It, I wanted to say later when we talk about recording, the music business was as cutthroat and as quick moving yes. from the 1840s onwards as it is today. Uh, and it has the same issues with gender, race, than it yes. has now as it did then. Um, one of the things that I wanted to move on to was we were talking about stereotypes um, and the depiction of African Americans. Um, because you're having to think, uh, this is in a political context. So in early minstrelsy, um, we're talking about slavery. We're talking about a large part of the known settled US being slave states. Uh, the only free African Americans were second class citizens in the north, of which there weren't that many. And the, the African American population was a really significant part of the total population. Um, I'm not sure of the exact figures, but we're talking about 30 or 40 percent. So one of the things we're looking at, I think, is um, social control. How do you control populations and make sure that your own people are thinking along the right lines when it just permeates the culture? So stereotypes began very early. Um, so you have the Jim Crow stereotype of the rural um, dancing. Happy go lucky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you also have the um, sophisticated uh, who is dangerous sophisticated African American male who is dangerous so there's a sheet here called Long Tail Blue from 1840 um, and it's not as stereotyped as some later which is interesting but it's it's putting down that this is he's like a classy dude man he is yeah, the yeah. song of course is laughing a bit yeah. pretentious